Welcome. Thank you all for coming last semester or last seminar of the semester. I always get a little sad because it's going to be another month plus before we have another one. Um, before we start, I want to do a quick survey. Raise your hand if you consider yourself uh, an economist or applied economist. Raise your mind. Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> Sociology, geography, uh, history. All right. Uh, uh, public health. Yeah, so hold on, yeah, epidemiology. Not so many epidemiologists. Interesting. And then uh, health economics or health policy. Okay, and public affairs. Anybody else? Where? What would you say? Oh, you forgot the geographer. I forgot. No, I said geography. Oh, they're all at a conference. Oh, right. The geographers are all at a conference. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, and then raise your hand if you're here for extra credit for a class. And you're welcome. Don't be shy. Okay. And uh, which of you are here not for uh, the geography class or sociology methods? Does that cover everybody who's here for credit? Okay. Welcome. Um, I think that's all the survey questions I have. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Susan Arnold. She's an assistant professor um, in, uh, in environmental health sciences uh, in the School of Public Health. She has a 2015 PhD in industrial hygiene and environmental health science. She specializes in developing and evaluating uh, and applying mathematical models to estimate exposure to occupational hazards, occupational, in, in, in typically in sort of cool settings um, that she'll talk about. Um, she also co-founded and is the director of U of M's Exposure Science and Sustainability Institute. And for her troubles, uh, for walking all the way over, we present our, a trophy and, uh, in our gratitude. So thank you. The floor is yours. Well, although they're say, neither are here at the moment, I wanted to say thanks to Jude and Alan for inviting me and, and Gina. And thanks to all of you for giving me a chance to share my research. Um, I just want to start out saying that uh, this talk will be, I think, a lot more effective and more fun if it's very interactive. So please feel free to ask questions as we go along. I've left a lot of room for, a, a lot of time for Q&A and um, that way too. I'm, I wasn't quite sure how much background to include at each step. So again, please feel free to ask your questions. I guarantee you I will learn more than I teach. So I'm looking forward to um, hearing your questions. Uh, as Rob indicated, I'm with the School of Public Health. I've been there for two years in the Division of Environmental Health Science. And I'm one of three industrial hygiene faculty there. Um, raise your hand if you've heard of industrial hygiene before. OK, a couple. So there are a lot of hands that didn't go up. All right, so I like to explain, um, or like to define industrial hygiene in this way. A medical doctor diagnoses and treats disease. An industrial hygienist anticipates, recognizes, and manages workplace exposures that can lead to disease, and thereby control them. By controlling them, we prevent those exposures that can lead to work-related disease so that the workers remain healthy. So it's very much a, um, a um, proactive kind of profession. Uh, previously, I worked for more than 20 years as a plant and corporate hygienist and industrial hygiene consultant and it was as a consultant that I recognized systematic barriers to accurate exposure assessments that limit our effectiveness as practitioners, particularly in non-traditional workplaces like beauty salons. Workers in these settings, which all hereafter call beauty salon professionals, are overwhelmingly female and in many cases are recent immigrants. They face a disproportionate risk of overexposure to chemicals compared to their clients and are thus doubly impacted by barriers to accurate exposure assessments. The need to address these barrier barriers motivated my transition to academia, where I could applied, uh, where I could conduct applied research. As part of that transition in 2015, I co-founded the Exposure Science and Sustainability Institute, or ESSE, to foster excellence in research and training and to address industry-identified research needs. And what I mean by this is I recognized from my career as a practitioner that there were a lot of gaps, um, questions that people in various industries wanted to answer, but there was enough of a research component to pursuing an answer that it was outside of what they could do in their daily 
um, kind of with their daily tasks and resources. So SE provides a framework where industry can industry um, colleagues can come and ask us to look at a particular research question that has a very um, that has a very focused uh, endpoint and intention. The the outcome of which will be focused very specifically. Um, so, for example, one study conducted last year was a consumer product exposure study in which we estimated an evaporation rate for acetic acid um, evaporating from an all-purpose floor cleaner into the room air. So, just if, you, if the um, product contains chemicals that have uh, a vapor pressure above a certain threshold, then when those products are used, they can, those chemicals can evaporate into the room air and you breathe the room air. So if there are contaminants in that air, you breathe in those contaminants, um, which is why we care about these things. So this work was conducted in our exposure chamber, which you can see some of in the slide here. Um, the exposure chamber is a small room within our lab where we can control environmental conditions, such as airflow, and then we can measure the time-varying concentration of the chemical of interest. So in other words, we can measure the concentration as it changes over time. This allowed us to back calculate and solve for the evaporation rate. So knowing the ventilation rate and the concentration in the air, we could just work backwards in our algorithm. Um, one of the unique and, and really powerful aspects of this study is that we could estimate an evaporation rate of, of acetic acid, which is one of the chemicals in the chemical mixture. It's very um, challenging to use chemical principles to estimate evaporation rates from, from mixtures as opposed to pure chemicals. So, um, so this, this work facilitated uh, a, very, a very much more refined evaporation rate, um, which means we were a lot, we, we could generate an evaporation rate that was a lot more accurate. Uh, now, one could argue that I'm the only woman who would pursue a PhD, so I could mop floors, but <laughs> it was for a good cause. Uh, I use a range of methods to estimate exposures, from directly measuring them in the field, uh, from directly measuring them in the field, um, to conducting uh, simulating exposure scenarios under controlled conditions, as we did with the floor cleaning scenario as well as modeling exposures uh, using mathematical models. The direct measurements in the real world uh, may be the most representative, but they're also the most challenging to collect. Simulating exposures in the chamber allows us to control some of the conditions while evaluating the critical exposure determinants. So in the floor cleaning example, we were interested in determining that generation rate, and what we were able to do was very much control how much cleaner went on the floor, how long it was mopped for, how much fresh air was moving through that room. We could, we could measure that and we could control it. So knowing those factors with a high degree of accuracy allowed us to develop an evaporation rate that was a lot more accurate than the previous version. Um, mathematical models are useful for answering what-if questions. They're incredibly powerful. But since they are uh, simplified versions of the real world by design, they can't fully represent that full world, that real world. So there are trade-offs in these tools. Um, the most powerful system is one in which we can combine to some sort of hybrid um, study, which, which we've done in a number of cases. So we've used both field measurements data and knowledge about what's really happening there with studies in the chamber and then link those to models so that we can really leverage what we learn. So accordingly, I have a toolbox of direct reading and integrated sampling uh, instruments, um, integrated sampling with respect to time. So in some cases, I can collect a measurement over time and determine the average concentration, but I also have several um, instruments that will allow me to measure the concentration as it changes over time. So this allows me to measure the contaminant mass in the room air, as well as on surfaces. Now why do you, why do you suppose I care about what's on a work surface? People will touch it. People will touch it, exactly. And some chemicals can cause um, skin reactions, and some chemicals can get through the skin and cause systemic 
effects. So we, that would be a dermal route of exposure. So absolutely. Um, I also have instruments for particulates that allow me to characterize them by particle size, uh, mass, and number. And just as a, a kind of an industrial hygiene convention, we equate external exposure with dose. So just if I happen to say dose, I'm talking about uh, when we collect our measurements, it's really to the, to the boundary of the external body. Okay. All right. So what do we know about the beauty salon industry? Well, we know that it's a, billion, a multi billion dollar enterprise. And in fact, the nail salon industry alone brings in over $7 billion a year. In the US, more than 650,000 individuals work in hair and nail salons. And the numbers vary state to state, but here in Minnesota, there are over 23,000 individuals that work in this industry. The vast majority of these beauty salon professionals are women and are mostly child, or many of which are child, of childbearing age. A significant proportion, both nationally and here in Minnesota, are of Vietnamese descent. And uh, in many cases, these women are recent, relatively recent immigrants. They have limited post-secondary education and mi uh, minimal to moderate Engli English language proficiency. The business model applied to the salons is for the owner, the salon owner to rent out the chair or the station or to pay the beauty salon professional on a purely commission basis. In fact, in the nail salon industry, only about 4% of the um, beauty salon professionals are employed under the conventional work, uh, full-time employment paradigm with a salary and benefits. So. Um, very, very few, and the hair salon uh, business model is similar. Many salons are open seven days a week with extended hours on Fridays and Saturdays, so the shifts can be very long. And this is especially true during major holidays and the summer season. Hair salons are a lot like R&D labs, research and development labs, with many products in use. So the products often, complain, often contain complex formulations of chemicals. Um, what you can see here, here are the reported ingredients of just two hair products. Some of these chemicals evaporate into the workplace air during product use, and then as I mentioned earlier, are inhaled um, by the beauty salon professionals. So consider the following example. To color hair, hairstylists first apply a treatment that contains ammonia. What that ammonia does is it, it um, expands the hair follicle so that, <coughs> it, so that the hair color will adhere to the hair uh, better. To achieve the desired amount of ammonia in the mixture, two products are mixed just before the treatment is applied to the hair. So there's a chemical reaction. And when that chemical reaction is initiated, there's a rapid release of ammonia into the <coughs> stylus um, into the stylus breathing zone. At high enough concentrations, brief exposures to ammonia can trigger asthma, can, asthma symptoms. And notice that neither of the product formulations shown here indicates ammonia in formulation. Skin exposure, as I mentioned earlier, is a, another common route by which chemicals get on and through beauty salon professional skin. Some of the chemicals are potent sensitizers. And just, for the, just in case, um, you've not heard this before. A sensitizer is an agent that will cause a reaction that stimulates or that, yeah, that initiates that sensitization and then any subsequent exposure can cause a very severe reaction and that reaction might be a skin reaction or it might be, could be if it's a respiratory sensitizer, it can cause a severe respiratory reaction. So once um, once an individual is sensitized, they can no longer work in that environment. So this literally can end their career. It's very, very disruptive. Uh, in nail salons, there are also many products in use, and the chemicals used to formulate these products include industrial solvents, such as N-heptane and toluene, plasticizers, such as dibutyl phthalate, aldehydes, including formaldehyde, and esters such as methyl methacrylate, 
which the manufacturers use to alter the flexibility of the acrylate monomers and copolymers. And as you can imagine in the nail salon, they're using small quantities, but the nail salon professionals work very, very close to the source when applying the products. So what evaporates into the air, they breathe in. Due to the nature of their work and the dexterity required, they rarely wear gloves. So skin contact <coughs> is a common exposure route for these professionals as well. Unlike an R&D lab, there's little regulatory oversight. Product manufacturers are not required under FDA rules to disclose the product ingredients or the compositions. So there's little transparency in what chemicals the beauty salon professionals are handling and to which they are exposed. For example, despite claims of being toluene free, the majority of nail polishes tested in a recent study were found to contain detectable levels of toluene. Um, another example, manufacturers renamed the chemical compound toluene sulfonamide, which is a potent skin a sensitizer, to tosyl amide. And this facilitated claims on the label that their product was toluene sulfonamide free. Most salons have fewer than 10 employees. In fact, most of them don't have any employees. Um, and one of the consequences of this is that there's little oversight by OSHA. The, and a consequence of the, of the loose regulation is that the chemical exposures to which these professionals are, are um, exposed are poorly characterized, meaning we don't know what they're exposed to. We, we have not quantified the exposure, so we don't understand the magnitude or the variability of those exposures. And consequently, those exposures remain poorly controlled. Yes. Is there any um, is there any kind of regulation or possible penalty, even if it isn't often enforced, for things like that um, renaming a hazard? Like, I don't even suppose this falls under FDA control because it's not a food or a drug, but then I guess it doesn't <coughs> fall under OSHA because it's small. Businesses? Is there any kind of regulatory? It's that's the thing. It's, at all that someone could appeal to. They just they they largely fall through the cracks. So the regulations from the FDA reg regulations that apply to them are really kind of after the fact. So if someone came forward with proof that something had caused harm, then FDA could follow up. But there's no mechanism to proactively say. You need to test these formulations used in the way in which you intend and demonstrate that they're safe. And then again, you know, with OSHA being that they're mostly small facilities, they tend to fall through the cracks. Where they do, so, so one trend that has been helpful and, and positive is that many states require licensing. Um, and those are, um, so th those are at the state level. And, and then the cities, uh, some cities also require licensing. And so they can put in place requirements for a certain level of, um, of, commun of hazard communication to employees, which means they might promote or require um, safety data sheets be available. Um, the cities and the states can d uh, set um, building codes that so they can set minimal ventilation levels for example um, and in Minnesota as with as in many areas has taken the lead <coughs> on a number of levels so one of the things they um, changed relatively recently was a requirement that when the beauty salon professionals go back for um, renewal of their license that they have to take a certain number of hours of education that includes health and safety. And so, and they're just in the process of developing that curriculum. So some of our work, we're working very closely with them. So some of our work will help inform that. So um, this is a, a follow-up to what you just said. So as I envision it, these are, you know, relatively disadvantaged workers <coughs> who they don't control the building they're in. They're renting a chair. Um, and so, um, 
in some ways it seems to me that like they're kind of regulating or informing the wrong person. Like if I rent a chair, mm -hmm. you know, I guess I could say, well, if you don't improve the ventilation here, I'm not going to rent a cha chair here. I'll go to this other business to rent my chair. But it seems like the 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 infrastructure of like the person who owns the building that decides how much ventilation there is should be a, a pressure point rather than people who are in a relatively powerless position. Yeah, no, that's a good point, and and really it it really needs to be both, and that's one of the areas, especially with this research, where I'm trying to can okay, trying to have it all. Um, we want to promote regulations that will kind of hit things at the system level, so everything from building codes. So in order for a salon owner to get a license to operate in that building, they have to have a certain level, minimum level of ventilation, which means the owner either you know, has it or upgrades it or they go elsewhere. But also, I think it's there are a lot of um, decisions that can be made at the individual level, but the individual, love, the individual needs to know that that there are options and that the, the outcome of those decisions could make a difference in their exposure and, and consequently their health. So I think there are opportunities to improve this situation along the whole continuum. So very good points. Um, <coughs> oh, so yeah, and to illustrate that point, so in, the, in this loose regulation, so this is a uh, hair salon and this is what I call the all-purpose room. Um, because, let's see if I can, here you can see uh, the washing machine doubles as the hair color mixing station where the two-part system is mixed up in a, in, in a very small and poorly ventilated room and about six, six feet away lunch awaits. Um, and again, in this work model, most of these stylists work on commission, so time is money. And I didn't see, well, no, I maybe saw one stop and eat. But pretty much, it was either eat on the go or eat in between tasks while somebody was under the dryer or something. Um, as a hygienist, that's very concerning because that's where you tend to get a lot of hand-to-mouth, inadvertent contamination of food. You get carryover of product from the washing machine over to the table and the counter. And, and so again, you just get a lot of, facil facilitates a lot of um, contamination. So it's not a good situation. Characterization of the time varying concentration that captures the short term peak exposures are also understudied. In fact, I didn't, in okay, monitoring the literature for the last <coughs> two years, I've not seen any studies that have um, systematically looked at this. Yet, in the case of ammonia and other asthmogens, those exposures could be ex important exposure determinants contributing to respiratory system disease. So let me just explain this graphic. So this is from one of my direct reading instruments that measures the concentration over time. So the y-axis shows the ammonia concentrations in parts per million. And on the x-axis, we have time, which is um, it was measuring every minute. But the, um, so we've got from like 9 to 2, so almost a full day's exposure. And what we observed was that every time a beauty salon professional came back into this room, so these were measured right on the washing machine. Um, every time the salon professionals came back to mix up the color, there was this spike in ammonia concentration. And you can see they didn't last long, but just to help put them into context, there is something um, that we call a short-term exposure limit. So it's, a short, it's an exposure limit that is designed to uh, be a benchmark for exposures that are 15 minutes long or so. The short-term exposure limit from ammonia, for ammonia is 35 parts per million, so it would be about here. So you can see in, in just about every case, we would have exceeded that three to five times. And in fact, there are many other health effects that have been associated with the chemicals used in these products. Um, besides the short-term reversible effects, such as headaches, eye and respiratory irritation, and dermatitis, they've been associated with reproductive, carcinogenic, and neurological health effects. Many products, as I mentioned earlier, also contain uh, known skin and respiratory sensitizers. In France, 
hairdressing ranks third among the occupations with the highest risk of occupational asthma. However, for females, uh, hairdressing is, uh, hairdressers have the highest rate of occupational uh, asthma. And for both men and women, a higher risk uh, is all found only in baker and pastry workers and car painters. So clearly, this is an issue. But exposures leading to work-related disease can't be adequately addressed until their source, magnitude, and variability are all understood. So we have a lot of work to do. Furthermore, interventions must be designed that account for factors such as precarious employment that may influence who is overexposed and to what degree. So in Weil's study of economic reorganization and evolving corporate forms, he argues that global supply <coughs> chains, franchising, and layers of outsourcing have created fissured workplaces, driving declines in the direct employment relationships. Workers who perceive work insecurity experience significant adverse effects on their physical and mental health. Further, this insecurity may impact worker decision-making in ways that makes them more vulnerable to negative health and safety consequences, <coughs> such as exposures to chemicals at work. <coughs> the nature of the relationship between precarious, and empl precarious employment and worker exposure is poorly understood. Social determinants such as immigration <coughs> status, language barriers, and, contra and contractual work conditions contribute to precarious employment. These conditions may cause some beauty salon professionals to be exposed to higher chemical concentrations, thus making them more vulnerable to work-related uh, disease. And while, there, while an association between precarious and employment and health and well-being has been established, how they are related is not well understood. The prevalence of precarious work within the beauty salon industry specifically has also not been quantified. So we don't know um, yet how <coughs> prevalent this is, and we don't know exactly how precarious employment could be influencing the exposures these women are experiencing. <coughs> However, uh, cosmetology school representatives here in the Twin Cities suggest there is a relationship between exposure <coughs> and precarious employment on several levels. For example, there's differential, differential tolerance levels for increasing client service prices that, um, that are related to the salon's zip code or neighborhood and the socioeconomic status of its <coughs> client base. So in the more affluent neighborhoods, for example, salon professional salon owners might be able to raise the price of their services to help cover the cost of upgrading the ventilation system while in other less affluent neighborhoods, the salon owners can't raise their prices. They, they have no way to absorb that, <coughs> that cost. So if they upgrade the ventilation system, their profit margin evaporates. Yes, ma'am. Are there um, things besides ventilation that, <coughs> that could be done, like wearing a, ma a mask? Um, um, or you said often, like, people who do nails don't wear gloves because it, it limits their, I don't know, their flexibility in doing detail work. But um, I'm wondering, like, one, would masks and things like that help? And two, I wonder if um, there's a push against doing it, not because it isn't effective or helpful, <coughs> but because you don't want to be reminding your client base, yes, I'm going to be putting some toxic chemicals on your hands and your hands now. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Are you sure you're not an industrial hygienist? <laughs> Maybe I missed my calling. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And that's earlier when I was saying, you know, there are some kind of system level changes that could be made, but there are also changes at the individual level. One of the things I came to realize when I started studying this, I, I mean, again, I was really surprised at how little, um, how little data there were there was in the um, literature on exposure levels and on kind of which chemicals are they exposed to. And that becomes important because when you start um, looking to those kinds of solutions, i.e. gloves, respiratory protection, and so on, um, those are all very chemical specific. In fact, with, in both cases, they're both 
um, chemical specific and concentration specific. <coughs> so you have to know those details before you can set effective or identify um, effective interventions. In fact, that's even true with ventilation. Um, a little bit of a side, but since we have time, um, New York State um, set a regulation about a year ago, or enacted a regulation about a year ago, requiring that these salons, uh, the nail salons in particular, have local exhaust ventilation, which is great. Except, you have to know what the rate of emission is, you have to know something about the emission source and the chemical behavior of your contaminant source to know how much air you need to pull through that local exhaust ventilation. You have to know, you have to make sure that it's placed very close to the source because there's an inverse relationship where it's you know, kind of one foot away from the source and <coughs> it drops by the square root of that distance in effectiveness. So you, again, you really have to be sure that it's placed in the right um, location and that that worker is trained and knows not to stand in front of it while she performs the system. There's just a lot of details that need to be understood. So and so in case you couldn't tell, I'm really, really um, passionate about the need for this kind of foundational research first. We need to understand what are they exposed to, how much are they exposed to, um, what's the pattern of that exposure and how frequent, and then and as well as what other factors might be influencing this whole situation because then we can develop um, or at least pilot some effective interventions. So we're, we're, you know, we'll get there, but we have a lot of work to do before that. Yes, ma'am. So in some ways you may have, you sort of just responded to this question with what you just said, but I'm curious if there's discussion about using the tax code to subsidize capital improvements that are specifically directed <coughs> at improving <coughs> worker safety. Now that sounds like an economics kind of, it's, that's an excellent question. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. But good, good thing to look into. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, okay, so, uh, oh yeah, sorry, explain that. Um, okay, so, let's see. All right, so, my, so I'm working with a, a research team in the School of Public Health. Um, I have conducted some pilot research in both the hair salon, in both hair salons and nail salons. Um, we are, we've submitted a couple of proposal and we're look, proposals and we're looking for some funding to do a larger study but we will be continuing to submit research proposals. So if anybody's interested in contributing or anybody ha or you have ideas about how to shape these proposals, I'm really interested. I like that idea about the tax code, by the way. Okay, anyway, so um, just to focus on what we have done so far, um, the team, my team and I have uh, developed three hypotheses to explore the relationship between workplace chemical exposures and precarious employment to better understand which beauty salon professionals are most vulnerable. So this first hypothesis looks at the prevalence of precarious employment within the state of Minnesota in general, and then looks at um, seeing how beauty salon, the beauty salon profession stacks up against the other um, occupations in Minnesota. Um, with this second hypothesis, <coughs> we want to, um, to get at this one, we will be conducting exposure assessments in a number of salons. So I will go in and I will <coughs> categorize from front door to back door uh, what are the chemicals in use, what are the services provided, how are the chemicals used, um, what's, you know, what's the nat nature of your work and work schedule, and then bring all of my tools and toys in and collect um, inhalation exposure measurements and some, do some surface sampling to look at possible dermal sampling. Um, as we conduct that exposure assessment, we will also administer a um, kind of a slightly modified survey, a little more detailed survey than um, the questions that we are working with in the first hypothesis. And, um, and that will give us kind of c concurrent information about their sense of employment precariousness 
um, as we collect the exposure data. Okay, and then this third hypothesis is going to build from the first two uh, aims and hypotheses where we'll look at, because we will have collected exposure data in, the, um, in that second step, and we will have administered this survey, we can look at the relationship specifically of beauty salon professionals' exposures and how they um, relate to employ employment precariousness. So how are we going to do this? Well, we proposed a study in which we look at the precarious employment of Minnesota beauty salon professionals by mapping existing data from the CDC Behavioral Risk Factors Surveillance Survey. Yes, ma'am. Well, just real quick with your study, <coughs> have you looked at things such as race, for example, or gender, because that is something that could be affected by this exposure to relaxers, putting relaxers on the hair, which causes like greater exposure to a man than a white swan or, or other ethnicity, um, and that black swans tend to be in lower economic <coughs> communities than maybe a white salon. So it's supposed to, I know um, Chris Rock has a documentary, and he put a can of soda into a relaxer, and the chemicals burn through, the dissolve the metal. So like look at the added to a race issue and because depending on your ethnicity you're gonna have different chemicals that you put on your hair. Right, no, that's a really good point. I can on, on two levels because that that both um, kind of relates to this whole idea of kind of neighborhood and clientele and can how much um, how much movement can there be on the cost of the services as well as what are the services that are provided because um, for example, the Brazilian blowout, the, um, you say the relaxer, the products that are used to straighten the hair are, are used um, more frequently for certain ethnicities than for others. Another, um, another factor that's really important uh, that I learned from the work in, in the hair salon was that um, African American hair has different properties, therefore the hair products are formulated differently, and te they tend to be stronger. So the concentrations of those chemicals tend to be higher, and that's a really important difference to capture. So it's it's kind of across the board that's going to be an important um, factor to consider. And also, even if a woman of a certain ethnicity does have to, the money to go anywhere she wants, she still has to deal with that salon might not cater or know how to do her hair type. I've experienced that personally in this state, in this city already, simply saying, I don't do your <coughs> hair type. I don't have anyone trained to do your hair type. So even when <coughs> economics is not even a factor, and you do have options based on your, um, your, your class or whatever, you're still trapped because of your limitation of salons don't do your hair. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, that's just kind of another element of why it's so important that the salon owners and the people that work in those salons understand why this is an issue and you know, you wanna, we want to motivate the salon owners to do what they can with respect to the work environment and then also motivate the, um, the individual stylists to, to be, at least to be informed in their product choice. Um, so, for example, one of the, one of my students did some work in our chamber with hair salon products, and there were some that had some that were claimed to be low um, low ammonia uh, products, and others that you know didn't have that claim. And in that case, there was a significant difference in the amount of ammonia that was emitted. So, you know, um, my I said my long term goal is hope is to influence <coughs> the product developers, the, the manufacturer of these products, to to kind of change out the formulations as much as the technology will allow to minimize the concentrations of the nastier chemicals, but also to be more transparent so that the people buying and using these products know that if I'm going to provide this service to my client using this product, you know, at a minimum I need to have the front and back door open and I want to offer this service if possible when there are as few people working here as possible. So there are a lot of accommodations or things that can be done at the individual level, but people need to know that there is a need 
to do that and that there is a benefit to them to doing that. So um, and thank you for the questions. Um, all right, so we proposed this study. So this is part of our proposal. We're waiting to hear if it's, it's going to be funded or not. But we're um, looking at, for the first aim, using the Burfus data, including the Minnesota State Administered uh, Modules on Industry and Occupation and Healthcare Access, because we think that's another factor of uh, whether or not people have access to healthcare. So mapping information from those surveys to the SOFI Precarious Employment Framework. And um, in case you're not familiar with that, SOFI is an epidemiological survey instrument that was developed and validated in Europe for measuring social determinants of health. Um, within SOFI, there's six dimensions of this protocol from which an estimate of employment precarity can be derived. So we plan on summarizing these data for all employed Minnesotans and then com we'll compare the estimates of precarious employment uh, for BSPs with the rest of the Minnesota workers. So we can just kind of see again where, where this particular occupation stacks up relative to the others. Um, to further characterize employment precarity within the beauty salon professional um, community, a popula population data from a 2017 Minnesota survey that's currently underway by a research team will also be used. And we're hoping that we'll see 6,000 responses from this survey. So. Yes, ma'am. Would the current population survey look for you at all? Or are they lacking critical variables for what you need? Um, I think the, the current answer might would have to be it depends. It, it could, um, depending on what kinds of questions are answered. And again, this is where I'm looking to. To this group, I think, is going to be it. The whole um, realm of you working with surveys is a newer area for me. So it's one of the areas where I'm hoping to learn uh, from from you more about that and how we can improve our study design with that. Uh, okay, so oh, okay, so as part of this um, study, um, we'll convene uh, an advisory committee that's comprised of community stakeholders that will help guide the selection of these previously administered survey questions for each of the six precarious employment dimensions to ensure that they're relevant to the beauty salon professionals based in Minnesota. Um, the advisory committee members include nail and hair salon owners and state epidemiology representatives with expert knowledge of the state survey data. So we have some volunteers already identified for the advisory committee. Um, we'll, we'll evaluate precarious employment as it relates to the beauty salon professionals' exposures at several levels, including salon type um, and regional location of salon, as well as other factors. We'll evaluate the influence of each of these variables on the precarious employment score to identify the variables associated with the highest exposures for this group. Three focus groups will be convened with the beauty salon professionals recruited, recruited from the pilot study group. So that's that second aim where we'll go in and do um, conduct exposure assessments at, I think we proposed 12 salons. Um, so we will recruit from those volunteers, uh, women to be on this focus group, and they will, and then we'll conduct in-depth interviews with them after we've analyzed the results quantitatively so that they can <coughs> help us qualitatively understand what these results mean and mean to them. So together with the, qualitative and qu with the quantitative and qualitative analyses, we hope to provide insight into how precarious employment and beauty salon profession professionals' exposures are related and provide foundational information on which to design intervention studies. So I think that's, all right. So if you have any thoughts on comments on how to improve the study design or make this work more robust or where to go from here, or know of somebody who has money, um, <laughs> and I'd be very interested in hearing. What are the six dimensions of precarious employment? I'm not sure I heard. What are they? Um, I don't have them all but memorized, but, but it's, it's kind of, it's the kind of, um, they are the kind of elements that look to, um, do you have, do you have any kind of contract? Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of um, permanentness, permanent, or is it very temporary? Uh, do you have any control over your work schedule? Do you have access through your work to any sort of benefits? 
So those could be anything from paid time off to health care benefits and so on. Um, are you, do you feel safe in the workplace? And that can be everything from kind of bullying or being treated in a disrespectful way to feeling um, comfortable coming forward. So if you do, you know, some product really smells and irritates and burns your, you know, your, your sinuses, do you feel comfortable coming forward and saying, gosh, this is really irritating, can we change how we do this? Um, and I, there's another one that I'm, it's very closely related. It, and I should say that the how precarious employment is defined is very much an evolving thing. Um, there was a really good paper that came out just recently by one of the Canadian researchers. Um, the paper is called "Precarious Jobs: Where Are They, and How Do They Affect Well-Being?" And he came up with a different um, kind of a different metric, um, and they had, was working with a unique database. Um, that was from data from which was collected in southern Ontario. So she was looking at some things that are very, to me, kind of very practical kinds of questions. But it, the, I, I, I would say there is not one universally accepted definition of what that is. So I, I think the good news for us is we have lots of flexibility and how would we, how would we define that? How would we evaluate that? I'm curious if you've been in contact with unions at all. I understand that this type of work is very hard to unionize, but that there also are unions that are focused now on contingent workers and independent contractors. <coughs> and I'm also curious about whether there are countries where beauty salon workers are unionized and what kinds of um, workforce protections they end up bargaining for. Well, this is getting well outside my realm, but from my reading in the, of the literature, I think that there tends to be a um, greater degree of unionization in the Scandinavian countries, not surprising. Um, and then it, with respect to have I reached out to other unions, um, not yet. I mean, this work has been focused very much on the beauty salon profession. I have. There is a beauty salon collaborative that's been formed here, and that's a, a group of people who um, include salon owners and salon professionals, um, people from the Board of Cosmetology, people who work at or own uh, schools of cosmetology, people from the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, as well as researchers um, at the U. So it's a nice, very interdisciplinary <coughs> group. Um, we have somebody from OSHA, we have someone from the city, we have people from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So we haven't specifically touched necessarily on union. I actually I don't think there is a union that includes the beauty salon workers here. But what we but what we are going to be able to do, and I think this is really going to be very interesting and is important, is um, through our network, we for this work we'll be able to work with people who work in kind of small owner-operator salons right up to the Aveda kind of salons. So across a wide range of, um, of levels of oversight. But back to your, probably more to your point, um, it occurred to me that my initial research was focused on beauty salon exposures because I was focused on exposures. But it also occurred to me that the beauty salon profession is a, an excellent case study for looking at the effect of precarious employment and exposure. Clearly, there are so many other professions where this is going to be an issue. But hopefully, some of the um, techniques and approaches we develop and test here will be okay. useful to carry over. I have no idea if this even exists, but I wonder if any, in terms of funding, do any of the large beauty companies, like Clairol or something, have um, any sort of charitable giving or, you know, giving back to the to the public and or could you even use this for sort of PR purposes? Have you explored whether any of the you know the, the, the corporations that make this kind of product might be open to this or have a mechanism for, for funding good works? It's something that I've considered and I think it's from what I know about those particular corporations and um, they're kind of, they're right now they're self-regulated, um, and so they have some they have some infrastructure set up. It's pretty much designed to 
be favorable to the product developers. But that being said, um, I think in general it's been my experience that if you can come forward with a, a well-designed plan and show them that that they probably are going to benefit from what you're doing, they're usually open to, to work with you on some level. I wonder if there, you're talking about that um, different products of different levels of, of toxicity on various mm -hmm. dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there are companies that sort of market themselves as, as green or safer or whatever, and um, if they might, um, one, be you know perhaps more open to it because they'll look better than the beginning. Yeah, no, absolutely. It is definitely worth exploring. There's, there's been, I mean, there are a number of interesting um, initiatives underway in, in some states. California is the kind of the poster child. They've, they initiated a safer, um, safer salon program. Um, it's a voluntary program, but of course there, there's a lot of PR that goes with the certificate that you could put in the window. And so now there are some product manufacturers that are con connecting to that and marketing their products for that initiative. We don't have that here in Minnesota, but that's something that we are looking at as we build this research, being able to um, not adopt what they have, but adapt. And and also we're in community, I have some contacts there, so we're definitely kind of staying in touch so that we can you know, we can just kind of keep improving the system and help one another out as we each learn um, how to do that. But no, there's absolutely, you know, there's some some avenues that way, I think, you, you can kind of work it both ways. You can kind of put pressure on them, a little bit of kind of public um, spotlighting of, gosh, these products say they don't have this, but they do, as well as, oh, as you say, look at these four products. The one that says that it's low ammonia is indeed low emit, uh, ammonia emitting. And, you know, there's opportunities to go. They have, um, they have these shows, I think, four times a year. And it's like a mini Las Vegas. It's very, very, I mean, these are artists, right? So there's lots of color and sound and noise and um, definitely PowerPoint wouldn't cut it. Um, but there are opportunities to go and share this kind of information and, and directly and indirectly provide that information back to the, to the formulators, to the manufacturers. So we just need to make sure we have robust data so that it's real science that we're, um, that we're communicating. Yes, sir. I may have touched on this already, but is there a sense, or is there, are you seeing any sort of um, just rejection of the science of this being bad for you among either the owners or the or the actual uh, people doing the work, where they're saying, you know, yeah, you say this is going to kill me eventually, but, you know, I don't really see that happening. Um, you know, it's interesting. That's a great, great question. So we met with um, some representatives from one of the cosmetology schools a couple of months ago, and the one, oh, the owner said, I, I'll tell you what, he said, I'm one of your naysayers. I don't believe this is an issue, and I really don't think it should be regulated. So I want, I want to open up my school. I want you to come in and use these facilities. And, you know, if you can prove me wrong, prove me wrong. But kind of here's my working hypothesis. So he was really open to it. Um, from our limited surveys that we you know, did in the, in the pilot studies, um, most of the practitioners believe that there are some issues, and, and then their, kind of their degree of concern varied, but the, no one said, no, I don't think this is a problem at all. There is a, you know, we have this healthy worker effect where the people that are in the workplaces tend to be the healthiest because as people get ill, they leave the workplace, so it's kind of somewhat self-selecting. Um, and the beauty salon industry is one where there's a very high rate of, um, of workers having to leave, I think it's about 35%, quite a high rate of turnover. So, you know, chances are anybody that's been there for a couple of years, they, they know somebody that's had to leave because they weren't well. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, related to that, it would be interesting to uh, know to, to get a database of those who don't renew their licenses <coughs> and then to uh, you know, try to find out you know, why they left. And uh, you know, if you're trying to demonstrate the extent of the problem, you know, of course the people who are there who are your focus groups and the ones who are the survivors and they can kind of do it from day to day. Right, that's a good point. That's a good point. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I guess, I mean, there are other things also affecting um, whether they can keep working there or their health and so forth. I mean, 
as you point out, I mean, their working hours are reasonably um, not very uh, uh, favorable or um, so forth and, and well. But these, so I guess the question is how, how does this compare to you know, an other or similar um, uh, line of work, but where they're not subjected to these kinds of chemicals? Because what I'm thinking here is that there are many things simultaneously affecting this high rate of exit from the from, from the work. Um, but the question is, it's kind of it's possibly difficult to to distinguish between the different um, factors. Right. So you you're kind of talking about finding a control group where yeah. we might have some of the precarious employment kind of factors, but yeah. not the chemical exactly. exposures. Yeah. We you know we thought about that. Um, and again, this is where my my limited knowledge of, of databases and, and survey work um, hurts. Um, yeah, it was a matter of trying to come up with a population that would be somewhat representative, that could in fact be, um, could act as a control group. Um, so it certainly could be something that we would want to look at next. On kind of the same lines, um, I would. I think you're you're op you've expressed open to this, but I would encourage you to think about looking at whether some of the, the national surveys, like the current population survey, um, might work. And um, I think it sounds like you sort of came up with a list of the the factors that you think capture precarious employment, and and from there found um, surveys that fit. Another approach you could have would be if you can identify as an occupational group people working in you know, beauty salons um, as an occupational category, you might then see, okay, what are the conditions of their employment that you can see in the current population survey? You know, that they work especially long hours or they have higher unemployment or whatever. So you might be able to come up with some other dimensions if you started with here's Here's my occupational group. How do they answer the questions related to employment in something like the CBS? Okay, great. That's a great thought. Following up on that, I would suggest the Quality of Employment Survey, which I think is run by the Federal Reserve, um, that may have similar information. I'm just chuckling because my daughter mm -hmm. just went to work at the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. I'll ask her about that. Mm -hmm. Do you know, um, I know that BRFAS, um varies across states, um, but it does seem like, and it sounds like you have, you know, a really a good plan for, for focusing on Minnesota, but I think um, if it's something where you can track the elements in terms of, you know, at least the, the survey section of it, it would be interesting to know what does this look like nationally? And my sense is, for example, I'd way rather have whatever crappy job it is in Minnesota than I would have it in Texas or Alabama or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to, to maybe at a later extend stage mm -hmm. um, extend this to nationally and look at state variation. Sure, sure, no, that's a good thought. The, the, um, the funding agency that, I, that we applied Two was NIOSH, and it was as a KO1, a Career Development Award. So, they they're very generous in their salary coverage. They're not so generous in the actual dollars to do research. So that's why we had limited limited it initially. But right. But Although again, if you can do some of the work, I mean, maybe some things you can only do in Minnesota or that are in depth, like going into the salon. Mm -hmm. But you could have that as sort of like your in depth case study, and right. then if you have nationally representative free public data like, you know, Burfus All States or CPS or whatever, um, that is, is not as um, financially demanding to right. make the broader right. general. But sessions. you're right, that would be really interesting and potentially very important. I think there's another question at the back. No? Well, we only have time for one more question, so I don't want to take the floor if anyone else has a question. I think it's yours. Okay. Um, I wanted to go back to Jonas's point about the healthy survivor issue. It seems like, so, so as I understood it, you wanted to, you're going to do focus groups among the survey respondents. Yes. So it, 
it might be profitable to try to do a focus group or two among people who are not survey respondents, who, you know, young Vietnamese women who have recently worked in the field or something, um, to, to get the, those who had to leave, they either chose to leave for some reason or another or had to leave because of the exposure issues. That's a great idea. So if you survey at multiple points in time, you can get people who leave and then you know, do statistics to figure out what proportion they should be of the people if they had stayed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this is fascinating.